Right, good evening and welcome everybody. Let's make a start. Uh, so I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Danny Kendall. I'll be chairing tonight's meeting of Stratford Island District Council's Planning Committee. Um, and I'll be doing so in accordance with the rules and procedures as set out in the front page of your agendas tonight. Before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping, if that's OK. Um, we, uh, mobile phones, if you please make sure those are switched to silence or even off, that'd be fantastic. So we don't get any um, in interruptions during the evening. Uh, the meeting is being live streamed uh, right now on the council website and will be available the next few days on uh, YouTube as well, should you wish to see it again. What else? This is, of course, uh, not a public meeting. It's a meeting held in public. So unless you've registered to speak, you won't be allowed to speak in this meeting. And finally, we're not planning any fire drills, but should there be a fire alarm? Well, follow me. I'll be making a very quick dash out to the car park there and you can try and keep up with me. I'll be very fast. All right. So that's, I think, most of that out the way. I'm going to do a few introductions of officers. Uh, our Representatives of the committee services tonight are Caroline Nash, who's at the back, and we've got Sophie Jarrett here on my right. Then on my far right is Ross Chambers, who's our legal services representative. On my left is Dale Barker, our planning manager. And then we have our two case officers, Joe Brook and Amy Flute. Uh, Dale, I believe you've got a statement to make at this point. I have, thank you, Chair. My role tonight is to provide impartial advice and to assist members in their decision taking. Thank you, Chair. Wonderful, thank you, Dale. Right, I think that's everything out of the way. So we move to item number one, apologies for absence. Thank you, Chairman. We have apologies from councillors Richard and Eden tonight. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, disclosure of interests. Uh, yes, Councillor Foreman. Yeah, can I declare an interest in item five? I am on the planning committee of Ulster Town Council, so therefore I will step away from the table and take no part in that item. Thank you very much, okay. Any other disclosures of interest? No. Excellent. We have minutes uh, of the meeting held on the 19th of January. Are you all content that we sign those as a true record? A lot of nodding, thank you. That's brilliant. In that case, I think we can move to our first application for the evening, which is item four found on page nine of your agendas. Uh, this is application reference 20 slash 02569 REM and is Long Last and Storage Depot, Camden Road, Lower Quinton. This is then the submission of a reserved matters application for the development of 38 residential dwellings on the eastern part of the Phase B site. Uh, presenting officer is Joe Brook. Joe, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just trying to get it up. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Take a second. This was working fine 10 minutes ago. And for some reason, it is not coming along. She's got dialing manually. I've been kicked out of the meeting. Have to use my machine. Yeah, for good day, I'll be kicked. Well, I need to get all my presentations. So. Uh, yeah, that's true, but it's still better than nothing. There you go. Thanks very much. I'll see if I can make yours work. <laughs> you should have bought it back. Yeah, do that straight away then. Just keep swapping them around. <laughs> there we go. OK, let's do that again. So, presenting officer, Joe Brook, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Okay. I apologise for that. The application site is located at Meon Vale, as indicated by the black dot before you. The principle of the residential development of the application site was granted under application reference 14 slash 01186 OUT. Further to this, applicants further around applications of 26 approved in 2016 approved the development of 118 dwellings on the phase 4B site. This is what's before you on the plan. So this is phase 4B in the red line. Following from that, a 2018 application allowed the alteration of some of the housing mix. Consequently, the site subject to this application will extend permission for the development of up to 116 dwellings. 
the current proposal is for 38 dwellings, which, just given this parcel of land, is an increase of 11 dwellings from the previous extant permission. Furthermore, no additional land is being proposed to be developed and there is no loss of meanty land from the extant permissions. This application is for the redesign of the eastern portion of the phase 4B development, as shown by the layout plan for you, to provide a more efficient use of the layout and an alternative mix of dwellings. This is referenced in the officer's report. This application would increase the density to 24.62 dwellings per hectare from the previous extant permissions. This is still lower than the previous reserve matter approvals on the adjacent phase of the development at Meon Vale. Also, the plan before you gives the indication of the street scenes and the heights and the proposed dwelling mix. The dwellings before you will be constructed out of red brick and grey slate with pitch roofs to maintain the continuity of the rest of the Meon Vale development. The dwellings would also utilise modern grey window and door frames with blue brick detailing on the principal elevations to help break up the facade and stand out within the elevation. This is the application site itself, as you can see. So this is the dwellings that back onto the area. So the area is at the minute off seat, completely blank. Road has been put in, but I have to highlight it does have extant permission on there, so they are permitted to do that. And these are the dwellings that are done adjacent to the site. Obviously, red bit detailing, grey slate roofs, pitch roofs, and also you can see that detailing has been put in front. Overall, the application is considered to be a betterment than the previous approved extant permission for the reasons set out in the officer's report and is considered to comply with all policy stipulations and requirements as set out in the area's development plan. Recommendation is therefore for approval. I will also highlight, Chair, that there is some updates to the application. We have received a response from the LFA, the Local Flood Authority, and they have now raised no objections. So officer's recommendation is for approval. There's also been amendments in the National Environment section of the report. Ecology did request the condition. However, this can, given this is a reserve matters application, we are obliged to put the conditions on to it. However, condition 33, the original outline, does allow that work to be conditioned, so they'd have to re-discharge it. Furthermore, highways have come back to me and also said they're satisfied that the construction management plan that they requested can be discharged through conditions 31, 32 and 46 of the original outline permission. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Excellent. Right, so we got our first speaker. Uh, this is uh, Peter Haywood, please, the agent for the applicant, and uh, Sarah Edwards uh, from St Modwin Homes. Welcome. So what I didn't cover at the beginning is we do have COVID restrictions still. So we, we, if when you sit down speaking, yes, go for the hand sanitizer first. Thank you both. And then, of course, when you finish, if you wipe down the desk with the um, wet wipes, that'd be fantastic as well. Thank you both. Right, you have three minutes between you. How, how are we dividing this up? I do the speech myself and then any questions then. Excellent. OK, that's fantastic. Okay. Right. Well, in that case, uh, Mr. Haywood, you have three minutes. Uh, I'll give you a warning at the la in the last 10 seconds, if, you, if that's OK. Yeah, sure. Over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Members of Planning Committee, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Pete Haywood and I act on behalf of the applicants of Modern Homes. I'm joined by Sarah Edwards, Planning Manager at St. Modern Homes, should you have any questions. The application now before you seeks reserve matter approval for 38 dwellings at Phase 4B of Meon Vale representing a replant of the eastern area of this phase. Your authority granted outline planning permission for phase four, Meon Vale in 2015, and most phases are now well advanced. Importantly, phase 4B already benefits from reserve matters approval, 118 dwellings, and the majority of this has now been completed, including the affordable housing, although the eastern area remains undeveloped. The current proposal seeks to replan the eastern area in order to deliver a higher quality design, greater efficiency and a more appropriate housing mix. The application has been under consideration since summer 2020, including four rounds of design amendments and a road safety audit in response to consultee comments. This has resulted in all technical considerations being satisfied. Your officer has confirmed that this application will deliver several betterments compared to the approved scheme. These include enhanced protection of TPO trees, enhanced landscaping, including an approved landscape buffer, and enhanced housing mix and design. Turning to um, sustainability commitments, 
The scheme incorporates 15 of the sustainability credentials set out under your authority's development requirements SPD, significantly more than the minimum requirement of five suitable measures. These commitments include electrical vehicle charging points at each proposed home, covered and secure cycle storage at each proposed home, several cycle and pedestrian links to the wider area, including the greenway to the west, adaptation to enable each home to accommodate energy generation technologies, including solar PV panels, sustainable urban drainage systems, plus a 40% allowance for climate change, energy efficiency and carbon reduction improvements above and beyond those required by building regs, including higher standards on insulation, water efficiency and carbon reduction, and a 400 metre walking distance to the local centre and bus stops at Mion Vale. The proposals are in full accordance with the outline permission, the development plan and supplementary guidance. So modern homes are committed to delivering phase 4BE swiftly and to a high quality to complement the already established new community at Mion Vale. We therefore hope that you will support your officer's recommendation and approve this application, which will ensure a significant betterment compared to the existing reserve matters approval. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Well within your three minutes. Right, members of the committee, do we have any questions for the applicants? Seeing a lot of shaking of heads, in which case, I'll thank you both for your time this evening. If you would just give the desks a wipe down, many thanks. And we'll get ready for our next speaker. Our next speaker is Councillor Pertigella, ward member. Welcome. You know the routine, I think, by now, don't you? OK. Yeah, thank right, you. Right, so you have five minutes. If you'd remain seated for any questions at the end. Yeah, Over thank to you. you so um, these are additional 30, 38 houses um, and as they, uh, the applicant just um, confirmed, they will be part of the new village of Mion Vale. And first of all, I want to specify that my objections are with aspects of the reserve matters that have been proposed by the developer. And these reserve matters have been submitted after the council declared the climate emergency. And my point, and I hope those of the committees that we cannot have business as usual, and indeed, the applicant's own ambition, according to their website, is to be operationally net zero carbon by 2025 and fully net zero carbon by 2040. And Stratford and Avon District Council own vision to be one of the first UK carbon neutral districts supporting zero carbon construction. So I'm, I'm still waiting for an explanation of how the development will contribute to net zero carbon reduction. And while I'm pleased that there is some engagement with the Part 5 Climate Mitigation and Adaptation SDP, these plans do not go far enough in terms of environment for the lifespan of the proposed development. And the last thing we want is to have to um, retrofit these houses in 20 years. The proposals, while looking at the efficiency of fabric, is based on statutory planning obligations. And because of the climate emergency, which the Council recognised in July 2019, developers building in our district should be more ambitious, going beyond the current guidelines and building developments to passive house standards in terms of climate adaptation and mitigation. We should build zero carbon or ultra low energy housing developments with car free areas, social communal space on car free streets. And of course, the CO2 emissions come not just from ongoing energy use in households, but also from construction. So the embodied energy of materials, building fabric and space and water heating and travel as well. Um, so there is as I understand it, there is no renewable energy provided by the developers, so they are left to be installed by um, uh, future dwellers. Um, and I don't know what um, my understanding is, is that not all dwellings will have EV chargers. I'm not talking about the kind of the possibility of installing solar panels, but actually I would like uh, solar panels to be installed by the developers. I've asked also for cycle racks. Uh, to, you know, for visitors coming, cycling um, um, and so on. And um, a biodiversity net gain uh, should be sufficiently demonstrated in the development. 
also the houses and garages to the southwest corner are right up to the boundary, I understand, with an open space. So it's important to provide good boundary treatment here to maintain privacy, but also to improve the appearance of the rear of the housing from the open space. There have been instances of surface water flooding as well as sewage flooding in Mion Vale in private gardens, and I'm dealing right now with complaints from residents. In, in fact, uh, later on I should be writing to Sam Odwin about that. And I see that the local flood authority had objected. I see that there is an update. They have withdrawn their objection at the moment. But um, I, I am quite worried about these repeated incidents in, ve in very new houses in, in the new part of Mion Vale. And um, so that linked to my understanding that there are um, the permeable paving is only for four plots. And I think that all our surfaces, including footways, should be permeable unless there is a good reason otherwise. I also ask that an accessibility audit is undertaken. I see drop curbs where drives are. Uh, but we need drop curbs for pedestrians and those using mobility scooters, wheelchairs and buggies to ensure there are drop curbs in all junctions to enable people to move around safely and to reach the community facilities from this new development. And we're having quite a lot of problems in the um, uh, already inhabited part of Mion Vale where uh, there's a lack of drop curbs and we're having problems with of connectivity and we are complained about that. But because roads are unadopted, uh, the councils can do very much. So it's very important that at planning stage uh, we get this right. Also in view of the Equality Act 2010. So for this reason, Ten seconds. Yeah, I urge the planning committee to reject the application until a better environmentally friendly scheme is presented. Thank you. Any questions for our ward member from the committee? No? seeing shaking heads in that case thank you very much for your time as well if you could just wipe things down that'd be fantastic thank you okay those are our speakers on the first application um let's move to points of clarification do we have any questions at this point councillor jennings and councillor adam thank you chairman uh, the councillor's just mentioned about drop curbs get some clarification on that the only thing that I could really clarify on that point is this application has gone through heavy consultation with Warwickshire County Highways and they've now come to with road safety audits and all sorts that has been required from it and they've come back with no objections to the layouts. Drop curves may be a problem there but our statutory consultees hasn't raised that as a major issue. So they're happy with it. Okay thank you. Councillor Adam. Thanks a, a slight list so I'll try and rattle through them. Um, I noticed that the on the, the site layout as it is in the report includes the whole sort of area and that it's segmented somewhat onto the on the plan that we've got am i is that the east west that's referenced so what it is so let me go to that one this is phase 4b in its entirety so that was granted outline permission so what this is is a section of that phase 4b which you're allowed to do under a separate reserve matters application so this before you is only for this red line boundary in front of you but that but it's part of the same outline that was granted as the phase 4B area. So me on Vale in 2014, let me try and see if I can get my point, point working. All this was permitted in 2014. The red line here is the phase 4B area. This reserve matters application is for that it parcel within the phase 4B area. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's like that in the report because it is segmented, but that's how it is set out in planning. Yeah, sure. And in terms of the whole 4B, I not sort of trying to go outside the boundaries of this particular um, application, but the, the question on affordable housing mix was in, in the report from the ward member. And I take it that's something this is fairly standard for this type of application or is it something we do? Yeah, it is. The, the reason being is the affordable housing stuff also is, is covered under the outline and it's part of a section 106. So the affordable housing area isn't part of this area and you can see there's been no objection from the affordable housing team and SDC policy for that very reason. It doesn't affect the affordable housing. If it was in the area where the affordable housing has already been agreed via the 106 or something, that would be something we would have to consider, but that's why we got no objection. Okay. Um, but, but so for clarity, just, just, just to clarify that, I'm looking at Joe to make sure I've got this right. The total amount of affordable housing on 4B yeah. 
is correct for the total number of houses on 4B, even with these extra 11 houses. That's correct, because what it is is fundamentally in this area. Yeah, no, I, I thought so from the reading of the report, but I just wanted some clarity for the boundaries. The only other ones then I've got, um, I think the board member did ask about the number of EV charging points for all dwellings. The honest truth being with that is the EV charging points, you have to go to the original outlying permission and it wasn't a requirement, the outlying permission. EV charging points, unfortunately, for the REM application isn't a consideration. So they are proposing it as part of their climate change checklist, but I can't condition that to be put in to the development. So it's part of the climate change checklist. So it could well be the case it's not for all dwellings, but you have to consider that there was no the 116 dwellings there doesn't require it at all. OK, so again, Councillor, what we're saying here is that's one of the betterments. Yeah, we have achieved some EV charging, whereas previously we had none. And um, we are not in a position to say to the developer, you must provide 100 percent EV charging on this application. Mm -hmm. The future ones we will be not on this one because of its history. OK, yeah, no, th thank you for the clarification on that. Um, and the last one was, you know, the um, that they've gone well beyond the sort of minimum requirements for the, the measures for climate change, considering that was such a concern of the ward member. Are you able to just elaborate? I mean, I know, I know they've, they, they have. They've got, it. This, is the, this is the issue. The, the ward members, very right in what you're saying, it's very admirable, but we have to consider the policy requirements and the SPD requirements. It's just the way it is. If it goes to appeal for some reasons, it's going to be very, very hard to defend against. They have met their requirements and gone above them. Hmm. We can't ask more than what they've submitted. Yeah. No, that's fine. Like I say, it's just for clarification from my point of view reading it. So thank you for that. OK, got Councillor Dixon next, then Curtis, then I'll go to Councillor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the outline planning permission, uh, was that also in favour of the same developer or was it in respect of a previous developer? Because we've got an application here which is obviously in increasing the density of 4B. Um, I appreciate that we've just heard that the number of affordable houses, et cetera, meets the higher volume now being proposed. And it's also indicated in the report that the proposed housing mix is more in line with our own policy, though it's a, a definitely a, a, dis, a definite change on what was previously there in the outline. Um, but is, it a, is the outline and this applicant the same or are we dealing with a, no, you, a subsequent you, developer? You're dealing with a number of developments, uh, developers yeah. on me um, Vale. So when it was permitted in 2018, uh, sorry, 2014, well, 2015, but the, the application was 2014 reference. It was for the whole site. The, yeah. the areas have been subdivided by various developers, as you often get with them. It's what I had. application. Yeah. Um, so it is what I had anticipated. Thank you, Chairman. The pre yeah, I do apologise. The pre Dale's raised a very good point there. The previous reserve matters for phase 4B is St Modwin's. It is the same applicant that has got the extant permission for the reserve matters application. The outline, you've got Red Row here, you've got St Modwin's there and various different areas. So the 116 is the same developer? I believe so, yeah. Well, it certainly is in this area, yeah. Whoever it is, I'm sorry, I'm completely honest. This area here might not be St Modwin's, but I'll tell you what, that's even better. These dwellings here are St Modwin dwellings, which is adjacent to the site. OK, I've got my list. Councillor Curtis next, Board of Clarification. Yes, um, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm just going back to the affordable housing, Joe. Um, do we know or can you tell the committee what you say in there in the report on page 16, the proportion of and provision of affordable housing within phase B, phase 4B, won't be affected, but presumably if there are more houses being built, the proportion of affordable housing will be affected. Can you tell us what the proportion of affordable housing in for phase 4B will now be? It will stay the same in phase 4B. The proportion of affordable housing is in this area here. So that's 10 units in that area there. And that stays the same. That's why you've got no objection from the affordable housing team. But what is the pr the percentage of affordable housing within 4B so now? It'll be itself. It'll be it's around about 30 percent previously. But the issue that I have to highlight with that is that you are now referencing an application outside of this. 
So at the minute, the affordable housing doesn't affect the overall development. We are only considering this reserve matters application in front of us. And we've got a no objection from the affordable housing team saying that it still meets the requirements of affordable housing. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, I must admit, I'm still slightly struggling that if there are 11 more houses being built, it must it must affect the proportion of affordable housing within this. So yes, I mean, just my math. You're going back. Should be one more. The reason being, you're going back to the section 106 requirements under the original outline application. So it does get quite complicated under the section 106. And I agree it's an intensification of the, the density there. But they're still under affordable housing requirements and the full housing team raised no objection for this reason and the opinion that it still meets the policy requirements under the section 106. So for that on their purposes, they've raised no objection to this reserve maths application. They consider it's a better housing mix and a better a betterment to what it is overall because it's higher density. If, if I may, Councillor, I, I, I think you're right. The proportion must have changed. If there are more houses, the proportion must have changed. Yeah. But the answer that we're getting from your policy team is that the number is acceptable. Right. Um, but it may that's be the, the only answer we can give you tonight, I'm afraid. Than in our policy, which is 35%. The proportion will have changed marginally, yeah. yes, because of that. Yeah. I think we've got the answer to that. I think we'll move on. Councillor Fleming. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> My question is. Um, being part of the same climate change group as the ward member, um, why there's only four houses with uh, permeable driveways? Um, I mean, seem to mention that there's a lot of slabs and and pavia bricks and whatever else, uh, but only four houses with permeable driveways, which I thought was going to be a, a fairly high thing because to, to eliminate and reduce water runoff. That comes down to three points, to be honest. Uh, firstly, if you have a look in the landscaping bit, they have to re-discharge the hard and soft landscaping, so we can cover that bit when that comes to that point of part of the outline. Secondly, the flood authority have assessed it and raised no objections, so their opinion is what is being proposed through the modelling and the materials and our lot is sufficient. And thirdly, they still have to meet building regulations and the Land Drainage Act if this was ever permitted. OK, any more points of clarification? If not, let's go to the debate. Who wants to start? Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I say, I mean, I applaud the great aspirations of the ward member here, but um, they're meeting the current legislation or, or policy requirements. And in fact, they're, what they're doing is they're going above and beyond that. Um, I say, and if it complies with all the policy requirements, there are no statutory objections at all. Um, to go against the officer's um, decision or recommendations, we have to come up with very good, valid planning reasons. And I see no good planning reasons to go against the officer's recommendations. So I'm, I'm happy to actually recommend this, that uh, we go with the officer's recommendation. Just double check that that's a proposal that we. It is a proposal. Thank you, Councillor uh, Dixon. My concern is over the housing mix. Um, and looking at the foot of page 15 for members, um, where CS19 preferred housing mix is allowed four bedroom or larger than four bedroom, 15 to 20 percent. So if we take 20 percent of the 38. That gives me a maximum of seven point something or other, but makes a maximum of eight. However, there's 13 of such properties in this phase, and yet the officers indicate that the proportion of four plus bedrooms is marginally over. I would say it's about 50% over. Um, and therefore, uh, there is a move within this application against the prior outline permission for a reduction in the number of two bedroomed houses. They're going down from 34% of the approval to 21% of the approval. The three bedroomed houses are going down from 40% of the approval to 34% of the approval. But the four bedroomed and five bedroomed are going up from 21% to 34%. So there is a move within this application 
for taking small, removing smaller houses, two bedroom properties, and increasing the number of four and five bedroom properties. Now we might be within the uh, parameters of appropriate density, but I find this as a situation whereby a developer is basically saying, I can get more bang for my bucks if I build larger houses. So I must admit, I would wonder what necessarily the parish might have been thinking regarding an NDP and whether or not there's a need for four and five bedroom houses in the lo locality or whether the housing mix is being skewed to more expensive properties. Thank you. Uh, anybody else wishing to speak in the debate on this? I'll add my thoughts uh, at this point then. I understand what you're saying, uh, Councillor Dixon, but I, I feel that I, I feel we've got adequate answers from the officers and the team are happy with the with the housing mix, uh, like Councillor Jennings. I look, I, I mean, I think Councillor Pertigal, excellent, very admirable. And in a perfect world, I'd be saying, yeah, absolutely, let's go with higher standards. That'd be great. We don't live in a perfect world. We would it would be unreasonable for us to expect this developer to go any any further than they've gone. And if it did go to appeal, we wouldn't win that appeal. I think it's a good development as it's set out, and I'm happy to second the recommendation that we approve uh, the application. Does anybody else want to speak before we go to a vote? Councillor Curtis. I'm just agreeing with Councillor Dixon on the housing mix. If we're looking for, you know, it doesn't conform with policy CS19, I believe, um, given the percentages that you've uh, outlined for us, and I will be voting against on that basis. Well, fine. OK, anyone else want to speak? In that case, I think we go to the vote. Um, I don't think we have to update anything. The conditions are still the same, aren't they? So in that case, the proposal is that we approve subject to the LLFA approval. All those in favour of granting, please show. Six. OK, those against? Three. OK, three. Therefore, the committee resolves to grant application reference 20 slash 02569 slash REM. We can move to our next application. We'll just do a bit of musical chairs for a moment. And we'll just pause. OK, then our second application for the evening. I won't go too quickly, don't worry, is um, item five found on page 23 of the agenda pack. Uh, the applica application reference then is 21 slash 03482 slash FUL. This is Mill House, Birmingham Road, Kings. I always, it is Kings Coton, isn't it? I think I'm looking for a local person. I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, thank you. Thought so. Kings Coton um, and presenting officer is Amy Flute. Uh, I've not said what it is. It's the removal of storage buildings, palisade fence, breaking up of removal concrete slabs to facilitate the construction of detached dormer bungalow and carriage along with associated works. Amy, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. The site denoted by the black dot is an open countryside location washed over by the green belt and is designated as Arden Special Landscape Area. The application site is edged red. The blue line indicates other land within the applicant's ownership. This includes Mill House to the east and Streamways to the west. In addition, there are other dwellings within the applicant's ownership not indicated on this plan. The site Edge Red has a public footpath, AL58, running through it. The nearest listed building, coloured red on the plan, is to the east. Planning permission is sought for the construction of a detached dormer bungalow with garage, along with all other associated works, including the change of use of the land from land used currently for storage of caravans to residential use. A wildflower, meadow and orchard are proposed to the south of the site. Um, the palisade fence along the east and southern boundary will be removed and public footpath um, AL58 will require a diversion order in order to facilitate the development. Elevations of the dwellings and garage can now be seen. It is proposed to use red brick and tile. Dwellings will have two bedrooms, sorry, the dwelling will have two bedrooms and a large living space with office at ground floor. These images are taken from the site's frontage looking in a south and southeasterly direction. 
public footpath AR58 intersects the site um, at this point. Caravan storage operates along both the eastern and western sides of the site. The site's southern boundary can now be seen looking in a northerly direction from public footpath AL58. The existing storage building and palisade fencing will be removed. Looking towards the site now in a southwesterly direction, as I said, the palisade fence will be removed and the diverted public footpath, if an order is approved, would run along the boundary that can be seen. All of the conifer trees, which you can see, are to be removed. The top image shows neighbouring property streamways to the west of the site and the bottom image looking in an easterly direction shows streamways, garage and Grade 2 listed mill house in the distance. Chairman, there are an in principle objection to a dwelling in this location and the loss of employment land has not been justified. In addition, harm to the Greenbelt has been identified. It is not considered that there are very special circumstances to outweigh the harm to the green belt and the other identified harm. Chairman, the recommendation is to refuse the application for the reasons as detailed within the committee report. Please note that there are some updates on the update sheet too. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Right, we'll go to our first speaker on this application. That's the um, Ulster Town Council, Councillor Mike Bow, Chairman. Welcome, Councillor. So, Thank you. So you have three minutes if you'd remain seated for any questions at the end. And of course, you're already sanitising, which is brilliant. Thank you for that. Not yet. There's a little button in the middle. If you press that, perfect. I can hear you now. OK, three minutes over to you. Uh, last year, Mr Turner, with others, uh, presented the company's enhanced business strategy to further exploit European markets that account for 75 percent of the company's sales to date to ACC, ATC planning committee. For the strategy to be successful, some senior management functions need to be changed into two defined roles. One, improving and promoting existing models and development of new products, and two, day-to-day -day logistical and management needs of the estate, which also houses other businesses, including an expanding leading precision manufacturer. Previously successful business development strategies have resulted in job creation, which can be seen in the 28% increase in the number of permanent employees since July 2020. The additional dwelling was born out of the need to attract a person of suitable caliper for the logistical and overall management of the estate. Turning to the planning officer's reasons for refusal, firstly, the dwelling's remoteness, this is the planning officer stating the dwelling's remoteness from shops, facilities and services, identified need and functional need not met, therefore not sustainable development. We find this surprising given that existing housing in the immediate vicinity is adequately served, Further, that the company's business strategy does indeed demonstrate an identifiable need together with a functional need. Secondly, the proposal would result in a loss of employment use. Mr Turner is the employee in this instance and it's difficult to conclude as he owns the business that his employment is at risk. The question of, compromise, of, of what comprises an existing employment site is a matter of planning judgment. The Oxford definition of judgment is the ability to make considered decisions to come to sensible conclusions. ATC consent contend that a sensible con conclusion is that classifying these areas of loss of employment use stretches this definition. And lastly, that the proposal is inappropriate development within the green belt and harmful to the green belt by definition, stating that very special circumstances do not exist in this case. The case obviously is, however, mindful that if permission is forthcoming, the applicant will accept the condition to tie the dwelling to the business to restrict its sale on the open market. The officer concludes that this does not amount to a VSC, given that it has not been found that there is a need for additional dwelling to be linked to the business. Again, ATC believes this asserts that if the need was found, this would constitute a VSC, and we contend that the company's plan amounts to a very special circumstance and satisfies the essential need element. To conclude, the company's business strategy designed to enhance the company's sales has the potential for further job creation and is the driving force behind this application. The need for an additional dwelling is borne out of the evaluation by the company regarding the day-to-day -day logistical and management needs of the estate. We feel that refusal will stifle future job creation and therefore Ulster Town Council supports this application on the grounds that the business is likely to provide local opportunities for growth in job creation and economic benefits to the wider local community. Perfect, thank you very much. Any questions from the committee, please? 
No, looks like you're getting off lightly. <laughs> I'll uh, let you wipe down the button in the desk. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And we can move to our next uh, speaker, which is uh, Tony Turner, the applicant, and Liz uh, Nicholson, if you'd like to come up. Okay, and to double check this, you've got three minutes between you. Um, so you'll answer questions. Who, who's going to be speaking here? Uh, no, Mr Turner's going to speak and I'm just here for questions. Fantastic, thank you. Right, well, welcome both. You have three minutes between you. Um, Mr Turner if you'd, and, and Ms Nicholson, if you'd like to remain seated at the end for any questions, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman and members. <clears throat> um, in 1963, I started Turner Engineering to produce the world's first flail mowers for cutting roadside verges and hedges. Green Mac, uh, Green Mac Limiters was established in 1993 to design and manufacture a range of British wood chippers and green waste shredders. It has become a leading manufacturer in Europe and since your meeting on the 29th of September when we were employing 110 at that point, this has now increased to 123. We have a massive order book. Your recent approval to expand our production facilities is much appreciated. To achieve our production target, we have invested another million pounds in state-of-the-art machines. To maximise output, we are now operating two shift systems, and within six months, our labour force will exceed 140. We have our own green mech sales and support companies in Germany and France. My grandson is CEO of France, overseen by my daughter. Both companies still sell more than UK. 80% of our production is exported, helped considerably by two Queen's Awards for export and innovation. Turner R&D owns the industrial estate and 26 acres alongside one kilometre of the River Arrow, immediately upstream of Ulster. Since announcing my intention to rewild the land, I have agreed a request from the Environment Agency and Wildlife Trust to consider forming a wetlands area to create a natural flood prevention scheme to further mitigate flooding in Ulster and provide a haven for aquatic wildlife. The 100 plus trees to form an avenue, creating a park-like setting with a flock of sheep and other farm animals. Areas are being adopted by local schools to educate children in countryside matters. My own background is in farming and agricultural engineering. The four cottages at the mill and two lodges provide affordable accommodation for employees on the estate. My three children each own one third of both companies. Cheryl in France is company secretary to both. Jonathan's managing director of Greenmeg. My third daughter, Rebecca, and family need a new modest house tied to the estate to manage the security of the industrial estate, the 26 acre parkland, the animals and increased schools activity. Perhaps we should call it Jubilee Park leaving me to continue my passion, developing innovative products, seeking new export markets and ensuring ongoing employment and the business continues to prosper and that it remains in control of my family for future generations, continuing living up to the Turner R&D statement, which is engineering for a greener environment. Thank you. Perfect. I was just going to give you the one for 10 seconds. Excellent timing. OK, any questions, please, from the committee? Councillor Jennings. Just a quick one. Um, why does your business need someone extra on the site rather than within a five mile radius? I'm sorry, say. Sorry, I'll, I'll speak in this. Why does the business need someone on site rather than living within, I say, a five mile radius? Well, because in fact, you know, there is um, a, a lot of um, move, movements, traffic movements, for example, are also from the security point of view, but also too, you know, with what we're being asked to do by, from the environment point of view, um, we're forming, um, you know, a, a, a small farming enterprise, if you like, but uh, uh, with with animals, etc. And we need somebody, you know, living on site, you know, to, to, to attend to these, of course, as well as organising the movements that we're getting from the schools and, and if we open it up more to the public. Any other questions, please? No. In that case, thank you both for your time this evening. Thank you. Oh, hold on a sec. One more question. One more question. Go on, Councillor Jennings, just in time. And this is more of a technical side. Then. Um, 
there was uh, no marketing evidence produced. Why was that? It's simply because um, a letter has been provided by Trusloves, um, state agency surveyors, that there is no other use for this site than caravan storage, um, which is apparent as well because it's in the green belt. I mean, you're not going to be able to use this site and put new buildings up of that are of the size and scale that people want for modern employment purposes to get a, a valuable return. The caravans are run by Mr Turner along with all the other business things he has. It doesn't employ anybody. It's not an employment site at the moment. And Truslovs have confirmed there really is no other use for the site because in the Greenbelt planning would, would not really support that. Well, in that case, second time around, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Beth. <coughs> Go to our final speaker on this application, which is the ward member. Welcome, Councillor Cargill. Thank you, members. Right, this application is to build a modest home tied to the business for the director, Rebecca and family. Also, Town Council have stated this application does not, in their view, harm their vision of the NDP, particularly policy HB1 and that AS10 and CS10 are not applicable in this case. The reference to the officer's comments on EC4 and change of use, the explanatory note in the NDP 62.2.14 goes on to describe that this policy seeks to protect existing employment sites within the town by resisting their change of use to residential, not in the countryside. I do not therefore believe that this application is against the Ulster NDP. Regarding the caravan storage site, which you've been discussing, the report states that this is run by one person, the applicant. It was, until last year, the applicant's wife who ran it until her passing. Caravans can, as the officer describes, come and go, making them temporary buildings. However, up to 30 caravans have consistently been stored there for over 20 years. Therefore, it can accurately be described as permanent storage. The Lawful Development Certificate only allows for caravan storage, limiting further economic use. The quoted Chartered Surveyors Report states that the site has no beneficial commercial use apart from caravan storage. The Officer's Report goes on to say that what compromises or some comprises an existing employment site is a matter of planning judgment. I agree. Caravan storage has never been a full-time job and no one can make a full-time living from it. There is, as stated in the report, very little opportunity to increase employment here, whereas in the last year, Greenmac have employed, as we've just heard, over 13 additional staff. This also demonstrates that the current accommodation described by the applicant is needed for the workers of the factory. The owner and applicant is an, a local businessman who's provided employment in the area for many years. The business is expanding and security of the site comes with that. We're all seeing an increase in rural crime and Rebecca will not only be responsible for the security of the site, but also the wider management, which we've just heard about. The applicant mentioned they have grown, plans to grow the company, which is something I support, and I do not wish to see that jeopardised. The applicant has mentioned a grand vision for the area uh, surrounding this, uh, the site and will need, that will need management. The opportunities for natural landscape, flood meadows, rewilding and educational opportunities at Prince are, I believe, significant. Moving to the Green Belt concerns, I am a supporter and defender of the principle of Green Belt. However, in my opinion, in this case, the harm identified is significantly less than substantial. The officer's report notes that CS10 supports the partial or complete redevelopment of a previously developed brownfield site with a redundant or continuing use, subject to it not having a material or greater impact on the openness of the Green Belt. By removing up to 30 caravans, an incongruous palisade fence, a large concrete slab, tin shed and other debris. Well, I think those who are able to visit the site will agree with me that this will be a significant betterment to the area. The proposed development is effectively concealed from view. It's not on the main road or in full visibility. Considering the removal of the caravans with the building of a modest dwelling, I feel that this will not harm the openness of the countryside. The grand vision and a special is a, and a special circumstance, as far as I'm concerned, for the site includes the proposed relocation and betterment of the public footpath, improved access into the countryside, 
access to schools for educational purposes and for people to come in and join nature. Appropriate screening of the dwelling from the footpath is proposed. Members, in summary, you have the support of the Town Council, my support, no objections to the dwelling, no readily visible harm to the openness of the countryside, no loss of employment, in fact, an increase, sustained, improved sorry, sustainability, reuse of brownfield site, betterment of the site, significant landscape improvements, rewilding, educational opportunities, potential flood mitigation, and importantly, the potential to help and secure a rural business's prosperity into what can be an exciting future. Members, I hope you will agree with me that this is all about planning balance, and I believe that the proposed improvements outweigh any harm that has been identified. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the ward member? No. Just one from oh, go, Councillor Fleming. The um, the fact that somebody wants to live on site is this part and parcel of. I, know, I can't remember whether it was talked about, but if you're going to have livestock on there, you got this extra person on site because you've got livestock close by. Is that one of the reasons and why it can then be tied to the business as, as a dwelling rather than open market housing? That's one of the reasons, Councillor. I think the important thing is, the, as, as mentioned by the, uh, the applicant, there are a significant number of vehicle move movements um, through that site. Day, well, not all night because they got a double shift now because of the in increased capacity of the works. So that's one part of it, that, that element. But also, yes, there will be the, the actual management of the actual site when complete. My, my one question for the ward member is a lot's been made of the educational asset. Where's the nearest school and how far away is it? Well, in actual fact, it's, um, what is it? it's Ulster Grammar School. And as it so happens, some of the um, yeah, I'm the aware of that. There. Oh, you know, yes, okay. things I teach uh, there. But yeah. how far away is it by walking? In time, how long would it take you to walk to the site from, say, Ulster Grammar School? Now, for me, it'd be about 15 minutes. For a youngster, probably 10. No, it's um, it is we the the, the applicant has engaged with the the school, and they've been doing a uh, wildlife project on his land already and that they are discussing some of the other elements of that um, for future educational use. OK, thank you very much. Any other questions? Councillor Jennings. So do you know how many members of the family actually live on site at the moment? I believe um, Mr Turner, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. If there are no further questions. But we'll move on. Thank you very much for your time. I think, uh, Ross, I'm just going to say for, for clarity, I'm sure you'll be happy with this. I had no idea that Ulster Grammar School might. Points of clarification. What, what have we got? Councillor Mills. Thank, thank you very much. Amy, um, it's been quite a bit made by about loss of um, employment and you, you've got that on uh, page 37 and uh, elsewhere on page 28. Do we know how do we know how much it, loss of employment or gauge an approximate? Um, so for, for this application obviously the the loss of employment which we are looking at is obviously the loss of the land for the storage of caravans so as um, Mr Turner said I think it's just Mr Turner that is involved um, with the storage um, caravan business at the moment. It used to be his wife before her passing. Um, but um, as set out in the officer's report, um, the area of land is currently being used for the storage of caravans um, and it is considered, um, officers consider um, that for the purpose of policy, um, CS22 and the NDP policy is engaged um, and obviously there needs to be it needs to be demonstrated um, that effectively it's no longer viable um, for the for the business. So um, for example the development management considerations um, state that for this is for policy AS10 um, will require sufficient evidence to demonstrate that there is an essential need for a personal persons to be present on the site at all times. Um, 
sufficient to justify the provision of a residential accommodation, a case based solely on grounds of security will not necessarily be sufficient. Sorry, I've just read you the wrong paragraph of my report. <laughs> Um, let me just find find the right point. Sorry, I highlighted the wrong area. I found it now. <laughs> so policy CS 22 stipulates that an existing employment site should not be redeveloped or converted to non employment uses unless it is no longer viable or appropriate for business purpose. A rigorous assessment of each proposal of that nature will be undertaken. Chairman, if I can add to that, um, members will be familiar with the MPPF. They'll be familiar that the MPPF says that it has to be read as a whole. You can't just focus on the odd word here and there. That, that's generally the case when deciding planning applications. Can I just encourage members not to focus on this one element and see it as, as pivotal or determinative? It's a very small element of officers concern. Um, obviously officers, when they're writing the reports, we have to look at all of your policies. We have to give you advice on all of your policies. And this is a conflict with one of your policies, but it's a very small element of the total reasons for, for refusal in, in the officer report. So yes, by all means explore it, but don't see this as purely determinative of the application. All right, no, we have every right to ask though on it. Absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, any other points of clarification at this point? No. Yeah, carry on. Just actually following on um, Matt's, uh, uh, how far from the shops are we there? There's, I know there's a pub. Um, I'm not aware that there are any shops in King's Coton, um, so I would assume that You'd have to drive to the shops. The nearest as... um, location. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not aware of any shops um, in the village, but but I could be wrong. <laughs> Councillor Adam. Thanks. Um, just on the use of the site for the caravans as a business as it is, is there a potential fallback situation in terms of what the site could be used for in terms of business? I mean, obviously there's been some change from, from the, the passing of the person who originally managed it, which indicates there could be a change in the use of the site business wise. I saw just exploring how that how that's viewed from a planning point of view. So the, obviously the lawful development certificate allows the land to be used for the storage of the caravans. Um, so my understanding would be if there was any deviation from that, potentially a fresh planning application would be required for that to be considered. Again, Chair, if I can if I can add to that, um, I think on the site inspection, members saw that this company make a number of wheeled vehicles that can be towed behind cars or vans. Um, presumably with their expanding production, they occasionally need storage space and the ideal place to store small wheeled vehicles that can be towed, towed behind cars is a place where caravans are lawfully stored and that would be totally lawful. So there is a potential use there for the current business. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yes, oh, sorry, Councillor Mills, apologies. Um, I, I don't know if I missed the point. Uh, there's no conf uh, is there a conflict with the NDP? I'm, I'm just looking. Yeah. I just, can you um, highlight so, that again? So within the reasons for the, the reasons for refusal, the reasons for refusal, which are set out within the officer report, um, that there, there has been identified that there is conflict with the NDP. Um, so policy H, if I go, if you go to the principal section of the report, um, in relation to the erection of a dwelling, um, turning to the NDP policy, HBE1 identified identifies the site as a countryside location and stipulates that new housing in the countryside will only be supported in accordance with paragraph 79 of the MPPF. That's now paragraph 70, um, paragraph 80 and policies AS10 and CS10 of the core strategy. Um, so we've identified conflict with the NDP policy in that instance and obviously the core strategy. Um, also conflict with the NDP in relation to policy EC4 as well. Councillor Fleming. Having listened to that and having listened to the town councillor, um, he said he was quite happy with the the uh, the 
the, the this building being built and it didn't offend them in terms of their NDP. I just wonder where we where we were at a difference with the town council and and the and the, uh, the planning officer. I'm not sure if that's something you can answer, really, is it? Amy? I think maybe we'll come back to that as part of the debate, really. I think. Okay. That's, that's for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? No. Let's go to the debate then. Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chairman. I agree with the uh, with the ward member, um, but uh, Amy, could we possibly put up the photographs, please, of the site as it is now? Um, the ones there we are. That'll do, I think, probably situation whereby and I'm now looking at page 31 final paragraph where it op opens up overall it is considered that the proposal would have a significantly greater impact on the green belt in terms of openness as a matter of fact I would disagree um, those caravans I agree understand in planning terms they're temporary buildings and could be moved etc uh, and obviously another uh, reason which we could use that same piece of land or the owners could use that same piece of land would be for storing his wood chippers. Um, but even if each of those caravans was replaced by a wood chipper, I would think probably I would still have the same opinion that a single, a two bedroom bungalow in replacement of those, I would not see as significantly impacting and harming the Greenbelt. I would actually regard and agree with the councillor, uh, the ward member, that it would be an improvement um, therefore, in truth, I will not be supporting the officer's recommendation on this one. Thank you. Anybody else wish to comment? Councillor Adam. Yeah, I, I, I think I do agree with Councillor Dixon. I'm, I'm finding it hard to um, accumulate sort of the, the hard um, planning reasons against it, which is why I was sort of asking about potential fallbacks and things. But I think the balance of this, which is what the ward member talked about, was that the harm wasn't going to be substantial in the way that is being sort of suggested and I, mean, I'm, I apologize that I couldn't make the site visit but you, know, you can see from the photos that that it's not sort of the most attractive view in the countryside as it is and obviously it is visible from from um, a footpath I'm not going to make a proposal just yet because I like I said I haven't got something hard to sit on uh, for, for that kind of reasoning but I am that's the way I'm going at the moment based on the planning balance, I'd say. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Yes, I, I have to say, I think it would be an improvement having um, dwelling there. And uh, unfortunately, Amy, I will go against the officer's recommendation on that. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Jennings. Yeah, I think we've got to be a bit careful about it, though, because what you're saying is that any field you've got with caravans, you just pile it full of junk, and it's going to look better if we get rid of it and put a house in its place. It's in the middle of the green belt. You know, it is it is what it is. And just because it's got something there which you don't particularly like at the moment doesn't give you a reason to say, yeah, we, because that just, it means everyone say who's got a field, they can pile old cars in there, pile old caravans and say, it will look better if there's a nice five bedroom house there, which of course it will, but that's not the way it works. Uh, Councillor Mills and then Councillor Flanagan. Yeah, I, I'm, as I understand, it's all going to be landscaped. You're going to get, take the, the conifers are going to go. I mean, it, it's it just got to be an improvement, Mr Chairman. Councillor Fleming. I still see this as related to potential employment of somebody else on the land because of the, I'm not saying it should be an agricultural tie or an agricultural restriction, but certainly limited to the to the businesses within the site. Um, and uh, I I don't see the harm. The problem I have is um, coming up with the special circumstances to defeat the Greenbelt object. So, so in general, I wouldn't support the officer's recommendation, but I'm not sure I can come up with all the, all, all the reasons myself as, as to why. Right, Councillor Curtis and Councillor Crump. Um, I think we should also take into account the support from from the Town Council and their Neighbourhood Development Plan, which I think I do feel sometimes we don't always give due weight to local Neighbourhood Development Plans. Thank you. OK, Councillor Crump. Apologies, Mr Chairman. I, it's a slight point of clarification. I was a bit dense and a bit slow there, so many apologies. 
has the application um, got a tie to the uh, to the business in this? Was it actually proposed? I can't see it anywhere, but is there a tie proposed of the That's application? That's a fair question. So I do apologise if I have missed that. So within the supporting documentation, um, the applicant has said that they would be willing to accept a condition to effectively tie the dwelling to the business. But they didn't originally propose a tie. <laughs> the it's with it's within the planning statement that they would um they would obviously be willing to have a condition to that effect yeah chair if i may the fact that it's offered doesn't make a condition lawful or acceptable and my advice to you would be that um personal conditions of this nature are not acceptable for agricultural workers dwellings for agricultural workers dwellings they have to be available to the agricultural community not to one specific farm and i think this that condition is very unlikely to to pass the tests for a planning condition and i'm sure your your legal advisor can can give you some more advice on that and for clarity this is not being proposed as an agricultural workers dwelling is it not, not for an agricultural workers dwelling but equally mm. it's not being proposed to tie it to the business okay that's the fine report you've got in front of you is for a standalone dwelling. Absolutely, I think that's important that we keep uh, keep in mind. Uh, Ross, do you want to comment further? Are you happy with that? Yeah, just to just to say that it's not being proposed as an agricultural type. It's being, as I understand it, proposed that the occupier of the dwelling will work in, at the adjacent business. Um, you know, it would need to pass the tests for any planning condition, um, and we can maybe explore that. Um, Potentially, it could be the subject of a legal agreement as well, um, but it would that would need to be necessary to make the development acceptable. Mm. So we need to demonstrate very clearly that it's um, linked, tied as part of the business, and it has very special circumstances as well. All right, um, we've gone through everybody listed so far. I'm going to add my thoughts. I, I'm I'm not seeing the the, the grounds for this, and I'm, I'm uncomfortable with what people are suggesting in that, like Councillor Jennings said, I think, you know, it's a field oh, because it'd look better, put a house on it. Well, we could all agree with that, but we have got our set of rules and regulations that state very clearly we've got to find very special circumstances. Well, I'm not seeing them here. I'm not seeing very special circumstances being presented. I'm seeing a, a site where, where it would be nice to put a house, but there's no tie to the current business, no formal tie being proposed. It's not an agricultural workers dwelling as we would understand it. I'm just not seeing the reasons to go for this. I'm sorry, but I, I'm just not. And, and what's more, I asked in uh, beforehand in the briefing to clarify how this is different to the previous application that this committee refused before. And I'm not seeing any noticeable difference, not any major difference. I'm seeing certain cosmetic things around the side, but I'm not seeing any major difference. So for them, for me, I'm going to be supporting the officer's recommendation on this. And it's not been proposed yet, but I'm going to put it out there and propose that we, we refuse this application in, in, in line with the officer's recommendation. Now, um, Councillor Dixon, you've been waving at me. Go ahead. Thank you, Jeremy. I just thought I wanted to comment on the uh, what Councillor Jennings had said about the fact that you know just put a load of cars and dumps and all that into a field and uh, that basically let's that, change all that for a nice house. Well, the answer is this one's got a, a lawful development certificate for actually having caravans. And if somebody with a field decided they'd fill it with full of junk, that junk would have to be removed, enforcement, etc., because they wouldn't have permission to create storage on a basically green field in the green belt. So that is a is not a reason for saying that it can easily be replicated elsewhere. That's for one. The as to, as to special circumstances, um, the planners can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but special circumstances required when harm is identified. If we actually come to the conclusion that a bungalow is less harmful than that, do we need very special circumstances to approve it is the question and finally um, when it comes to tying properties i wondered where we are regarding application 17.02031 which was for two lodge type homes to provide affordable accommodation etc now i think they were tied to the business 
Um, and therefore, if those were tied to the business, presumably a bungalow could be tied to the business as well. I'll let Dale have a think about that. We'll go to, to Councillor Jennings. Come back, that well, let's come back on, on that. But it, what you're saying that way is that every caravan site is a potential building plot. I would agree with what you just said there. I mean, that is effectively what you're saying. And by my understanding of a caravan, by definition, it's not permanent. It moves around. Councillor Crump. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think there is definitely merit in this application, but I still think, judging from the debate we've had so far, there's still some uncertainties about things about this application um, and about whether there's a functional or essential need for the person to be on site. Um, and I know security was mentioned, and then I've heard that there's a potential night shift or there's, a, there's, there's more people using the site throughout the day and potentially the evening at night. And I might be paraphrasing there wrongly, but I think I'm getting some nods there. So there may be security concerns that have been addressed by more people on the site. But notice that I'm using the word may because I'm not I haven't got the information in front of me or, or I may have missed it, but it's just this element of uncertainty. And I know uh, an ex councillor, uh, a late departed councillor, used to be on this planning committee. If it's not quite right, it's wrong. And I would just like to see a bit more evidence on this, that there is this essential need and it can be demonstrated and independently verified to say we need it because of X, Y and Z and we'll be able to expand the business, safeguard the business, and we'll be able to offer all these different things to do with the environment, to do with education, to do with training, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And if that was demonstrated, I would be more than happy to go against the officer's recommendation to, to build in the green belt. Um, and again, it's a slight unsustainable location. So I want to support this and I want to support local business. And I think Mr Turner's uh, tremendous, you know, uh, and I've got so much admiration for what he's doing and what he's done. Um, I would never be able to do any of these things. So it's, it, it's brilliant. So but I, I'm just not quite happy from the planning point of view. So unfortunately, my head is overall in my heart at the moment and I will be supporting the officer orientation. So it's not quite right, but I think it, it can get there. So that's that's my view, I'm afraid. OK, in my list, I've got Councillor Jennings then Councillor Curtis. And I'd like to concur with what you've just said. I mean, I think this, the business, and I'd love to be able to say, yep, um, you deserve a house <laughs> because of all the great work you do. But unfortunately, I mean, I know that when this came before us last time, there were elements there which we kept on saying, well, yes, like a director, they can live down the road. There's already, there's someone on site, you can hire a, you can hire a security firm. You know, there are, there are options. Um, with the caravan site, it keeps on saying, yep, it's at least 50% occupied all the time. That's sort of, it's almost like you don't want to read that if you want to support this, which I'd love to be able to support it. But, you know, if it was saying, well, we have one caravan on there, it's a complete disaster. The business has gone down the toilet. It's, it's, it's not, it's not happening. So we need to use it for something else. It, um, you then at least got rid of one of these reasons to go against it. Um, since last time, there hasn't really been much difference from where we from where we were. Sort of, the things haven't been ticked off. If they were to come back and tick these things off, you know, yeah, I'm happy happy to go for it. But there's been no change from last time. And I'm not, I say that regrettably, because I think what they're doing is 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 admirable, really impressive. But unfortunately, this this doesn't seem to be right. Completely agree, uh, Councillor Curtis. Sorry, I'm just. Um, Councillor Jennings had mentioned that the, the, um, the, the, the thought we might be setting a precedent, but I think, you know, if we were to allow, you know, we then have fields full of, of rubbish old vehicles and, and so forth. But I think we're we're frequently reminded that decisions that we make as a committee don't actually set a precedent. Um, and just just an additional point, if I may, just picking up the the point of it employment use i'm sorry i can't find the page in here but we're not looking at in this instance um at a loss of employment 
So is there a distinction that we can make between the loss of employment, which there clearly isn't in this case, against the loss of a site that currently offers employment? By removing the caravan site, there is no loss of employment because the same person is still being employed by the company. So it seems surely a loss of employment should be measured by a job lost. In this case, there clearly isn't. OK, <laughs> right. Did you want to come back on a point that Councillor Dixon was making? Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, if I may, can I start with the issue of loss of employment? As I said before, members shouldn't be treating that as determinative. Let's let's say for the sake of argument that members do conclude that the loss of employment is not a reason to refuse this application. Um, that wouldn't change our recommendation in the slightest. If we took all of that element out, it does not change the officer recommendation based on your policies, based on decisions that you have taken in the past. It doesn't change our recommendation. So that's the first point. Um, second point was the issue of the, the cottages and the tie to the business. And you're absolutely right, Councillor Dixon, the, the cottages are tied to the business. Lodgers, lodgers sorry, lodgers, lodgers not cottages. Lodgers, my apologies, I, I wrote cottages. Um, so we have two lodgers that are tied to the business. We have a listed building that's a dwelling that's used in conjunction with the business. And in fact, we have six dwellings on site. And what we haven't heard anything on as part of this application is why one of those six dwellings cannot provide the management and supervision that they're looking for. If you look at the plan in front of you, you'll see that there's a red line, which is the application site, and there's a blue line, which is other land in the same ownership. And immediately next to the application site, you'll see there's a, a bungalow called Streamways, um, Amy showed you a photograph of it in her presentation, or at least of its garage. Um, that's in the same ownership. We haven't heard anything from the applicant about why that bungalow can't provide the supervision that they're looking for. If this was a, an application for any other workers dwelling in the open countryside, that's exactly the information we would be looking for. What accommodation do you have on this business? How um, do you use that accommodation? How is it that this accommodation cannot provide you with the essential management that you have to have on site? And we haven't heard anything of that from the applicant. Now, if, if they want to submit that as part of a separate okay. application. Dale, I'm going to cut you off there because I think you're in danger of becoming and debating on this one. So you're here to provide right. this information. So I'm going to cut you off Sorry, unceremoniously there. Right, uh, Councillor Milton. Mr Chairman, um, I, mean, I, I, I again I say start off by supporting this I'm, I'm probably going back listening to Councillor Crump and putting in um, can I change my mind on this um, and listen to the uh, Dale as well so um, I'm betwixt and between at the moment Mr Chairman uh, listen to a further debate on this so uh, I'll reserve judgment at the moment thank you. Okay Councillor Fleming. To take uh, Mr. Barker's point, um, they've got X number of properties with people that, you know, all these properties may well be fully occupied and not one of the people within those properties has the skill to do what the occupant of the, the new bungalow is going to be. So that kind of, for me on a personal level, that means that you haven't got anybody to do that. And I still see the, the, uh, the employment as a net gain of one because Nobody's losing their job because the caravans won't be there and you'll be moving somebody else onto the site to live in the bungalow. So rather than say there is no there's no uh, employment loss, there actually is an employment gain because you'll have one extra person on the site. Dale's shaking his head, so obviously that doesn't stand. Right, OK, I'm going to push this on. We've got a proposition, which was made by me, uh, that we refuse this application for the reasons that have been stated and are in the report. I'm going to ask to see if we've got a seconder for that, otherwise we need to go to something else, don't we? So do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Jennings seconds that. Um, no other proposition has been made by anyone yet, so unless anybody wants to put their hand up now and make a proposition, I'm going to go to the vote on this, for, on this first proposition. 
Councillor Dixon. One of the questions I posed was if we'd identified that there, we don't believe there's harm to the green belt, did we need special circumstances to, as it were, support the application? That I didn't get an answer to. Dale, if I can ask for a, a very brief one sentence answer on that one. Or less. <laughs> I can't get it to less than a sentence. On, sentence. If, if you're satisfied there's no harm to the green belt, then you don't need special, very special circumstances. Right. C Councillor Mills. So, sorry, Mr. Jim, just going back. Oh, 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 on the nearest residence, that bungalow there, that's that's not empty. That's people living in that bungalow, are they? My entire point, Chairman, is we don't know. Yes, and it's not part of the application. It's it's part of the owners. It's owned by the applicant, but it's not part of the application site. Right. OK, right. We've It's been proposed and seconded that we refuse this application. So I think we go to a vote on that and see where we are. All those in favour of refusal, please show. Two. Three. Three. OK, three. Those against? Four. Four. Abstentions? One. Right. OK, over to you guys. Come up with something for me. I would propose that we actually grant it on the basis that there is no perceived harm to the green belt. And that's proposed, is it? Yes. And Councillor Curtis. For the same reasons. I'm going to give Dale a second. Do you have any I sets of conditions? You've got conditions? Agree them with you tomorrow, Chair. It's okay, so it's standard set of agreement. Materials. Oh, we have got some. So I'm sorry. We have Go on. Set. We have a set of conditions. Yeah. We, I think what we want to hear from from members, Chair, is about this tie to the business. Yes, and I how, think right. and, and if they want to do that. Uh, other than that, it, it, it's very standard. Out of interest, would that tie be legally enforceable? Your solicitor, I'm sure, can answer that. Yes. Good. Ross. Well, yeah, I mean, if it's put in a legal agreement, it will be legally enforceable. Um, it's whether you consider that the legal agreement is necessary, the tie is necessary to make this development acceptable. Um, if you if you're happy with that, then I think we could put something in a legal agreement that's legally enforceable. We go, Councillor Dixon. Is that something you'd want to pursue? I don't think we need to. I think this property is intended for a single occupier, and I think that is as we heard previously for the continuation of the family business essentially and I don't think we would need to put that into a legal agreement. Okay, Councillor Curtis are you content with that as well? Would there be removal of permitted development rights on this? Sure. Are you content with that as well? Okay, do you want to say? So? Members, what do you want? Councillor Curtis, would you remove uh, permitted development rights or would you give, leave them as they are? Permitted development rights would be fairly restricted on mm. a single storey bungalow. It would probably only be able to go back eight yes. metres, would it? No, you can't even do that because that applies to built ones built before 2018 anyway. So you're happy? Um, it's a two storey right. bungalow, Chair. Would it make a difference? Would they be able to have permitted development? How far would they go back in, in, in your expertise? I can't remember. <laughs> they can do quite a lot on this big site. They can do quite a lot. Oh. OK, yes. Removal of permitted development rights in respect of outbuildings and those, per those parameters. I, I would feel more comfortable with yes. that given what's yes. being proposed. Yeah. yeah. Counts Curtis. Right. OK. Are you all happy? We've got everything we need. Yeah. OK, right. Uh, it's been proposed and seconded that we grant this application. Let's go to the vote. All those in favour, please show. OK, those against? Two. Abstentions, please. Two. OK. Therefore, the committee resolves to grant application reference 21 slash 03482 slash FUL. OK. We go to our last application of the evening. I'll give it a second for you. Just movement time, bit of movement time.
OK, so committee, we move to our final application and this item six of tonight's agenda on page 41. Uh, this is application reference then 21 slash 03229 slash FUL. This is 19 Barton Meadow Welford. Uh, it's for the single single story side and rear extension. Presenting officer, Joe Brook. Joe, over to you. Thank you, Chair. The application is located with Welf and Old Haven as indicated by the black dot before you. The site is located within the village conservation area and public footpath runs along the southern and east boundary of the application site. So just for reference, this is the application site and the public footpath, as you can see, by the green dash lines run along the application site and also out that way as well, I should say. The application seeks planning permission for a single storey side and rear extension. So these are the existing elevations. So this is number 19, which is part of the application. And this is the semi detached dwelling on the other side. I would advise to take note of the garage. Existing south elevation and east elevations and the floor plant. And this is the proposal. The extension would be single storey in height and whilst the proposed side extension would serve a garage and have a dual pitch roof and gable to side, which would essentially mirror the style of the other attached garage within the street scene. The maximum height of the extension would be six metres, 2.7 to eaves and a width and depth of 6.6 .6 metres. And these are the photos of the actual site. So. This is the property here as part of the application. This is the name and dwelling with the attached garage. This is the public footpath. So the property will be sited to your left just there. This is the dwelling house. That's where the garage would be sited. And this is to the rear of the property. So the uh, rear extension will be within beyond the fence line and the garage would be sited there. In consideration of the areas development plan, national policy and guidance, as well as the relevant statutory consultations, the OSA recommendation is grant subject to the recommended conditions as set out in the OSA report. There are no updates. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joe. We'll go to our first speaker, Councillor Neil Appleton, for Welford, Welford Parish Council. Thank you. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we've had a discussion beforehand. They didn't meet our requirements for the type of slides there. That's all right. That's OK. Uh, I, I'm sorry we can't show those, but maybe reference for next time. OK. OK. So you have three minutes. If you'd stay seated for any questions at the end, I'll give you a warning bell at 10 seconds, if that's all right. Thank you very Over much. To you. Yes, good evening, councillors. Um, with respect to this application, um, the parish council considered it uh, on 2nd of November of last year, uh, and there was much about it that the parish was prepared to support, but the proximity of the garage extension to the historic public right of way to the south was a blocking concern. Uh, the parish's objection is supported by two lines of evidence. Um, first, other recent developments adjacent to these paths, known historically as the alley and the limey, are features that reduce impact upon them. So one is Three Blundells Croft. It is close to where the alley emerges onto Headland Road. Permission for an extension over the garage was granted in 2002. It includes a low ridge and a hip roof to reduce impact upon the path. A pre-existing Norway maple further softens the design, particularly when it is in leaf. Another example is red maple. It is a bungalow at the other end of the path where the limey emerges onto Headland Road. Permission for a single storey extension was granted in 2020. Despite its close proximity, it is barely visible over the fence thanks to the roof design, which has a shallow pitch and a low ridge. Now, Barton Meadows was built after Peel in 2013. It too has a number of features that reduce impact upon the footpath. Um, Banner Homes did the following. They moved the development boundary, gifting land to widen the footpath corridors. The footpath corridor along the eastern edge, which is near plot nine and along there, so it's not in these photographs, um, is about six metres wide. The footpath corridor adjacent to number, third, number 19, Barton Meadow, which you can see there, is only about three metres wide. 
So the footpath corridor is much, much narrower here. Um, they also built, I don't know whether it's on there. Yes, you can see it to the, on the um, image to the top right. They um, they built a, a, a garage which has a hip roof so that it doesn't have as much impact. And they oriented the garage around the back of plot nine so that the roof doesn't, um, is the gable end isn't overlooking the footpath, but actually you've got the slope away from the footpath. And lastly, and most notably, they omitted the garage at number 19. All the afford, all except the affordable homes on Barton Meadows have garages. It is notable that number 19 does not. So the present application includes no feature to minimise impact of the design upon the adjacent footpath. Indeed, there is no evidence to suggest it has been considered in the design process. Which leads on to the second piece of evidence supporting the Parish Council's view and is focused upon the garage's design. So, um, yes, you can see the elevations. Um, 10 seconds. Sorry, I'm sort of struggling there a bit. Um, I think I'll just skip through this bit. If you can ask me some questions about the elevations, that would be great. Um, so anyway, for the parish council to support this application represent a change of position. They, this can only be justified by a change in policy or a change in design. There has been no material change in either. So the parish council view must therefore remain unchanged. I'm and going to have to pause you there. I'm sorry, I'm afraid your time has elapsed of three minutes. Hopefully we can uh, bring out something to do with the, in the questions. Any questions uh, from the members of the committee? <laughs> Councillor Adam, thank you. Councillor, could you tell me something about the elevations that you object to, please? <laughs> right. So, um, yes, the elevations are there. You can see that the um, elevation at number 19 has um, a garage next to it. Now, in the original application from 2013 with Banner Homes, there was an almost identical uh, elevation. Um, and this was rejected during the planning consultation process in favour of um, a design that you see before you, which actually is one without a garage at the side. And of course, the reason that it was removed was its impact upon the footpath next to it. Um, it should be said that the, the garage as proposed is further forward than the other garages on site. So it doesn't quite fit into the street scene quite as nicely as you might think, because it will be more open bearing. It is still subservient to the main property, which, which we fully accept, um, but we feel um, it could be more subservient, let's put it that way. That's OK, thank you. Um, yeah. OK, any other questions, Councillor Jennings? Yeah, the the footpath, you say it's about three metres at the moment. The footpath corridor is, yeah. yeah. And you, the actual footpath seems to be away from the house, and then there's a green verge. Yeah, that was the bit that was gifted to the footpath. Um, originally, the boundary line was very, very close to um, the footpath itself. It was basically a post, it was a post and wire fence originally. So it's been given, it's been um, gifted a certain amount. How how big is that? That on, in that location, it is about I would say 70 to 80 centimeters. Around the corner, it's much much more. It's about a meter and a half to two meters. Any other questions? Thank you. So, in that case, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you for your time, councillors. Okay. Um, we have another speaker, so we go to points of clarification. Anybody got some questions, Councillor Mills? Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the. Um, what are the separation distances between the fence and the proposed application? Uh, yeah, two seconds, Chair. I want to get a, the actual plan that shows it best. I believe it's in my reserve slide. There you go. So if you have a look, this is where the garage is being proposed. So that it's obviously with the fence line, it changes. So from here to the front of it, it is uh, 1.7 metres. From that point there, which is the closest to the fence line, that is 0.7 metres. OK, thanks, Joe. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Jennings. No, no. Is that your question as well? I was going to be my or, question. Uh, any other questions? Mm, Councillor Curtis? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, Joe, I was just wondering, um, the parish council member mentioned uh, that previously when the when the development was built, there was previously an application to include a garage on the side of that house, but it was refused. 
in relevance to this? If this committee previously refused an application, does that have any bearing? We need to look at this application before us. Only this application. Thank you. Sorry. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Fair point, but okay. Yeah. Right. Points of clarification out of the way. Debate. Who wants to kick off? Councillor Jennings. Okay. So on my calculations at the the furthest bit is two and a half meters away from the actual path. Um, and even on the, the smallest bit is the 0.7 plus 0.8, so that's a metre and a half. In Henley, all our paths, I mean, we've got public um, footpaths and it, we've got buildings right up to them and you squeeze through. I, I struggle to find, to see what the adverse impact is. Um, we have to get, like I've said it before, we have to give really good valid planning reasons to go against the officer's recommendations <clears throat> on this. I can't see it, so I'm happy to propose that we go with officer recommendations and approve this. Thank you. Councillor Mills. Thanks, Richard. So I, as you know, I always go and look at the sites. I did look at this site. Um, and I know we've got a garage on the side. I think it does even it up even for the street scene. Look, but um, like Councillor Jennings, I, I'd be very, it'd be very difficult to find a really good planning reason to refuse this. Thank you. Mr. Are you seconding the proposal? Yeah, I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else want to speak on this application? OK, in that case, let's go to the vote. It's been proposed and seconded that this application be granted. All those in favour, please show. Unanimous. Thank you. Therefore, the committee resolves to grant application reference 21 slash 03229 slash FUL. Don't think we have any urgent business this evening. So in that case, I'll declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. <laughs>